where will we animals from China to Cambodia to Nepal and more? Asia is a continent with the largest diversity of deer, and we'll start seeing that diversity in the first meadow, known as Compound Meadow. It does appear most of our deer are on the far side of the meadow, so we're going to have to wait about six minutes until we catch up with them. When we catch up to them, we will meet the Barasinga deer. The Barasinga deer can be recognized by its dark brown coat. They are the largest deer in the meadow. Next step down are the Bakshrian deer. The Bakshrian deer can be recognized by its white, ghostly, cream-colored coat. The Bakshrian deer are new deer here at Wild Asia. This is the first year we've had them on display. The Bakshrian deer come from Southeast Asia where they inhabit the swamp by the environments. And the smallest deer in the meadow are our Axis deer. The Axis deer is a deer covered in white spots. Many deer are born with white spots, but lose them as they age, but not the Axis deer. The Axis deer keeps those spots throughout their entire life. Here at the Bronx Zoo, we've had the Axis deer since 1899, when the zoo first opened. And then the one animal which is not a deer are our black buck antelope. The black buck antelope is a small species of antelope from Southeast Asia. They have the dark back, the white belly, and the horns. Once again, we will catch up with our animals in about six minutes when we get to the far side of the meadow. In the meantime, we'll listen to Michelle, one of our Wild Asia zookeepers, tell us a little more about the animals here at Compound Meadow. Hi, my name is Michelle. I'm part of the Wild Asia Keeper Team. We call this area Compound Meadow, where we care for about 40 Barasinga deer, 15 Axis deer, 10 Black Buck, and a pair of Munchak. We start our day by checking on all the animals making sure they are healthy, behaving normally, and safe. Sometimes, fawns and calves are born overnight. Newborns are given a neonatal exam, which includes weighing, vaccination, and tagging for identification purposes. While the animals are in the meadow, we prepare their nighttime holding areas so that they have a safe and clean place to spend the night. The next stop on our journey is home to the Mongolian wild horses, also known as the Shervalsky horse. As we pass our wild horses, you may notice they look a little different than the modern-day domestic horses we're accustomed to seeing. Our wild horses have shorter legs, a stockier build, and a shorter mane, which stand up like a mohawk. The Shavosky horse is known as a less living wild horse because it's the only horse which remains that have the traits of their ancestors. Just like how the modern-day domestic dog looked nothing like their canine ancestors, neither do the modern-day domestic horses. As we continue on our journey, we'll listen to our, our field scientists tell us more about the farms of Indonesia, followed by John and Slap with more about the horses. Farmers in Indonesia live closely with wild animals, like elephants, which we will see shortly. WCS field staff work with local leaders and farmers in Indonesia to come up with the Crop Protection Unit. This unit created many different ways for farming to continue in close proximity of wild animals. One strategy was to soak ropes in chili powder and place them around the crop. Elephants do not like chili and leave the farms alone, allowing the farmer and the animals to share the habitat peacefully. Jonathan Slat and the Russian and Northeast Asia working for the Wildlife Conservation Society. We believe that wildlife has a place on this earth. My job is to find practical solutions that allow people and wildlife to Kowalski's horse went extinct in the wild in the 1960s. And on a recent trip to Kazakhstan, we found out the ongoing and successful efforts in the country to bring these horses back to the Central Asian steppe. The world needs happy stories to watch the impossible become possible and to see hope restored. That's what's happening today with the Kowalski's horse. The next stop on our journey is home to the Gower. The Gower are the world's largest wild cattle. The Gower can stand up to six feet high, over ten feet long, and weigh as much as two thousand pounds. The Gower's enormous size allows it to fight off nearly any predator it may face in the wild, including the apex predator of Asia and the animal on the next stop of our journey, the tiger.
As we approach our tiger, you'll notice a wooden fence. This fence was erected to give our tiger a nice, quiet, secluded area to live in. The fence blocks out the sounds and noises coming from the Bronze River Parkway, which is directly behind us. Tigers are solitary animals, meaning they live by themselves, and that's why you'll only see one tiger in our exhibit today. Here at the Bronze Zoo, we're home to two different kinds of tigers, the Malayan tiger and the Siberian. Today, uh, here in Wild Asia, we have Zuhana, a female Malayan tiger. I'm going to try to help you guys find her first, and then I'll tell you a little more about Zuhana and our tigers. So, bottom of the hill, straight ahead of us. So, right by this perimeter fence line, by the rail, all the way in the front. It is a little hard to see her, but you will get a better view once we go around. So, Zuhana is a female Malayan tiger. The Malayan tiger come from the jungles of Southeast Asia. So, we're straight ahead, bottom of the hill. It, here at the Brown Zoo, we're home to the Malayan tiger and the Siberian tiger, also known as the Amur tiger. If you'd like to see some Siberian tiger, we do have them on display at Tiger Mountain. Tiger Mountain is a short walk away from the monorail. Go up to Asia Plaza steps and make your right, you'll be in Tiger Mountain. The Siberian tigers tend to be a little larger than the Malayan and have a much shorter coat. And I'm not sure Zuhana's age, but Zuhana is much, much smaller than our Siberian tigers. In the wild, there's about 4,000 tigers remaining here at the Brown Zoo. We are run by the Wildlife Conservation Society. And the majority of work the Conservation Society does is overseas, helping animals in their native habitat. We're working in nine different habitats in order to bring up the tiger population by 50% in each habitat. As we continue on our journey, we'll listen to that. Our field scientists tell us more about tigers in the wild. So black buck antelope, dark back, white bellies, left perimeter fence, the white spotted axis deer, behind the white spotted axis deer, the um, ghostly cream colored back strand deer. WCS works with many species of tigers in the wild and at the zoo. Here is a note from one of our field scientists about his experience working with rangers to protect tigers in Indonesia. Hi, my name is Farhan Lamani. I'm helping the rangers of the National Park to do their forest patrol. There was a time when we found some tigers with prints in the jungle. But then we also found that some snares are installed inside the forest, which become threats to the animal. We dismantle the snares to make sure that the tigers are safe. Next stop on our journey is home to the Babarusa. Babarusa means pig deer in the Malay language. It gets the name pig deer due to the tusks on its nose, which resemble deer antlers, and they are part of the pig family. So in that mud puddle, you'll see Linus. So to the right of the rocks, mud, Linus. And then in the second pond is Sprout, and October is Sprout's birthday month, and he turns one. And then Ivy was running around to the bottom left of the pond, and Ivy is Sprout's mother. The Barbarossa may be tough to spot sometimes due to it blending in with its rocky and sandy environment very well. But if you had a hard time seeing the Barbarossa, you should have no problem seeing the next animal on our journey, the world's largest land mammal, the elephant. This is Happy. Happy is a female Asian elephant, and she's over 50 years old. You may notice that Happy doesn't have any tusks. That's because female Asian elephants don't have tusks. Only the males do. Unlike their cousins, the African elephant, which both the males and females don't have tusks. Where? 
That trunk of Happy's is an enormous tool of hers. It contains over 10,000 muscles, which is more than the entire human body. The trunk has a finger like appendage at the tip that allows Happy to pick up something as small as a blade of grass or as large as a giant tree trunk. As we leave the world's largest land mammal behind, we will be visiting the second largest land mammal, the rhinoceros. You can see Callie inside her mud wallow. The mud wallow is basically that puddle of mud. The mud wallow is in a poor part of the rhinoceros habitat. While the rhinoceros looks like it has very tough skin, the skin of the rhinoceros is very delicate. So it uses the mud wallows to cover themselves in mud and add a layer of protection against the sun and insects. The Indian rhinoceros is also known as a one-horned rhino because it only has a one horn. The Indian rhinoceros come from North India and Nepal where there's about 3,000 remaining. Here at the Bronx Zoo we work with other zoos in breeding the rhinoceros in order to maintain genetic diversity among the population. And as we continue on our journey, we'll listen to our field scientists tell us more about elephants and rhinoceros in the wild. WCS works in the field with both African and Asian elephants. Here is a note from our field scientists who work with Asian elephants. My name is Donnie Gunaryadi, and I'm the Elephant Conservation Coordinator for WCS Indonesia. The first time I saw a Sumatran elephant, I thought, this is a magnificent creature. They will be safe because they are so big. But the truth is, they have declined 50% since the 1980s. Even though rats and insects cause more damage to crops than elephants, because the elephant is so huge, psychologically, it seems more threatening. So when there is conflict, the farmers poison the elephants. In response, we created a crop protection unit to mitigate conflict and send the elephants back into the park. And it's been a huge success. Since we started in 2003, no elephants and no people have been killed. The rhinos you see here are Indian rhinos. We work with habitats all over the world that are homes to rhinos. Here is a note from our field office in Sumatra. And Mulan, who works with the Sumatran rhinos. Sumatran rhinos are the smallest of the world's rhinos and they are considered critically in danger. My name is Bulan Pesri, and I'm a species conservation specialist for WCS Indonesia program. We carried out an island-wide survey of the last wild population of Sumatran rhinoceros in Indonesia. With so many unknowns on how to manage Sumatran rhinos in the wild or captivity, our studies showed definitively that we must protect them at source. The cost of doing nothing could be the extinction of the species, and I can't imagine that. The next stop on our journey is home to the sandbar deer and the neil guy antelope. The sandbar deer have the dark brown coats, the neil guy antelope light tan. You can also recognize the neil guy antelope by their white rump, white spots on the face and ears, and black and white stripes above the hooves. So let's see, they're usually up on this hill. This is my first tour of the day. Yep, so we follow this like muddy dirt path up the hill. All the way in the back, you'll see the sandbar deer. And then if you look to the last foliage section, or if you look at the Neil Guy antelope, white tan animals all the way in the back, you go to see the sandbar deer to the left. And I know they are a little tough to spot. And if you would like to get a better view of them, come on down to the monorail at about 3 o'clock. And that's when they make their way down the hill. So the Neil Guy antelope here at the Bronx Zoo are an all-female herd. And that's why you won't see any horns, because only the males have horns. Next stop on our journey is the tufted deer. The tufted deer is a small dark brown deer, almost black in color, white spots on the ears, white nose, and a white tail. The tufted deer gets its name for the tuft of hair on top of their head. Very, very small deer, as you can see right here. These are fully grown deer. The tufted deer come from the mountains of China where they use their white tail, just like the white tailed deer of New York use their white tail communicate with members of the herd. So this guy is a male and 
you can't see on this side. You have to look on his other tooth. It, you can see a very long, elongated canine tooth. His other one broke, but the males have those elongated canines, and they use them just as other deer use their antlers to fight off rival males and display dominance towards the females. Many captive animals call the Bronx Zoo their home, but many wild animals call the zoo their home as well. And the Bronx River plays an important part of the habitat. It provides a place for ducks, turtles, fish, migratory birds, and more to live, eat, and swim. Some animals that call the river their home are the red ear slider turtles, snapping turtles, mallard ducks, wood ducks, Canada geese, and every so often you'll see an osprey swoop down and grab a fish for dinner. Right after we cross over the Bronx River, we'll also very rocky terrain. That terrain is the perfect environment for the Marquor. The Marquor are the largest member of the goat family and the national animal of Pakistan. The Marquor have those corkscrew spiral horns that can grow up to three feet in length. The Marquor are excellent jumpers and climbers. They can jump over six feet high, better running start, and have rubber like cores in their hoofs that allow them to grip onto rocks and climb the steepest cliffs. The last stop on our journey is Linus, and Linus is down in his tree hammock right past the giant tree with the V next to the rail. So make sure you look more down than out, he's very close to the rail. Linus is an eight-year-old red panda. The red panda come from the mountains of Nepal, where it's known as Hon Ho, which roughly translates to Firefox. If you ever use a Firefox web browser, the mascot's not a fox, but rather a red panda. The red panda and giant panda do share a name with each other, but the red panda is more closely related to skunks, weasels, and raccoons than the giant panda, but both the red panda and giant panda do have one thing in common. They both love to eat bamboo. As we go around this bend, our journey is coming to an end. We are going to make a quick stop before our final destination, so please remain seated until the second stop and the doors are open. So this weekend is the last weekend for the Barack Zoo Halloween celebration, Boo at the Zoo. Boo at the Zoo will be taking place Saturday and Sunday. But once Boo at the Zoo is done, holiday lights will be starting up. Holiday lights is the evening time festival here at the Bronx Zoo. Holiday lights will be taking place between 5 and 10 p.m. on certain days, but 